In this video, I'm going to talk about word choice. One of the difficulties students have when writing an essay is choosing the right word to use or the exact expression or phrase they want to use in an essay in order to create a more effective message. So here I have some tips from the University of North, North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And on this website, uh, UNC talks about word choice. So word choice is a series of choices. As you work on a paper, you choose your topic, your approach, your sources, your thesis. And when it comes time to write, you have to choose the right words to express your ideas and decide how you will arrange those words into sentences and paragraphs. As you revise your draft, make sure you uh, ask yourself, is this really what I mean? Will readers understand this? Does this sound good? Finding words that capture your meaning and convey that meaning to your readers is challenging. When your instructors write things like awkward, vague, or wordy on your draft, they are letting you know that you need to work on word choice. So this handout will explain some common issues related to word choice and give you strategies for choosing the best words as you revise your drafts. As you read further into this uh, handout, keep that in mind. It could take uh, more time to save words from your original sentence than just to write a brand new sentence to convey the same meaning or idea. Don't be too attached to what you've already written. If you are willing to start a sentence fresh, you may be able to choose words with greater clarity. So if you write a paper that makes perfect sense to you but it comes back with awkward, why, you wonder, are instructors so fond of using terms like awkward? Most instructors use terms like this to draw your attention to sentences they had trouble understanding and to encourage you to rewrite those sentences more clearly. So here's an example. Having finished with studying, the pizza was quickly eaten. So here you have an example of a dangling modifier. Having finished with studying, so does this mean that the pizza finished studying and ate itself? Obviously not. She meant that after finishing studying, the students quickly ate the pizza. So this is an incorrect sentence because it's missing a subject. Because you, it's who finished studying? The students finished studying. So you want to make sure that your um, sentences have clear um, that your sentences are clear, you're not missing any subjects, and that if you have an adjective phrase like this, then you have the noun that it modifies right after the adjective phrase. Obviously, you're missing the noun that it modifies, so making this sentence unclear. So here you want to always have a clear sentence. So this is one reason why teachers would mark your paper as vague because you are making a dangling modifier mistake. Other ways in which um, you might have problems with clarity are a matter so problems with clarity are a matter of word choice. See if you recognize any of these issues. Misused words. The word doesn't actually mean what the writer thinks it does. Example, Cree Indians were a monotonous culture until French and British soldiers, uh, settlers, arrived. Monotonous means boring, so you never want to call anybody's culture boring. So I think what revision, Cree Indians were a homogenous culture. Homogenous means that it, its culture was very, uh, it, it did everything in one way, but that doesn't mean it's boring. In, in other words, it did everything traditionally. So traditional sounds much better than monotonous. So misused words, word choice. So that's one a way in which uh, word choice is important, is misused words. Words with unwanted connotations or meanings. Example, I sprayed the ants in their private places. Revision, I sprayed the ants in their hiding places. Using a pronoun when readers can't tell whom or what it refers to. My cousin hugged my brother Trey even though he didn't like him very much. So when you have two subjects, Jake, Trey, and your cousin, so when you start saying he and him, who are you talking about? Are you talking about Trey? Are you talking about Jake? And so it's always better to clarify 
who you're talking to. So my cousin Jake hugged my brother Trey, even though Jake doesn't like Trey very much. So instead of having too many pronouns, you specify what subject or what subjects you're talking about. And this usually happens is when you have more than one subject in a sentence. When you have like several, several subjects, then you have to clarify which subject is which. So that's one way in which you can clarify uh, your sentence for word choice. Another, another example of word choice, jargon or technical terms that make the readers work unnecessarily hard. Maybe you need to use some words that are easier for people to understand. Don't just use words to make yourself sound smart. Remember, if you're going to use jargon or technical terms, you have to be aware of your audience. If your audience are a bunch of beginners, they're not going to understand what you're talking about. And readers don't like to be overwhelmed, because as soon as a reader is overwhelmed, they're going to skip right over whatever it is you wrote. So for example, an example of overkill with technical terms is this one. The dialectical interface between Neoplatonists and anti-disestablishment Catholics offer an algorithm for deontological thought. Did you understand what that meant? No, because this writer used way too many technical words. So always assume that your reader has no idea what you're talking about, and so revise for simpler English, and you would say the dialogue between Neoplatonists and certain Catholic thinkers is a model for deontological thought. Still, it's a little bit for today's audience. Some people will not know what deontological, you're going to have to, you can revise it even farther to make it even simpler so that more people understand what's going on. Loaded language. Sometimes we writers know what we mean by a certain word, but we haven't ever spelled that out for readers. We rely too heavily on that word, perhaps repeating it often without clarifying what we are talking about. Society teaches young girls that beauty is their most important quality. In order to prevent eating disorders and other health problems, we must change society. Revision. Contemporary American popular media, like magazines and movies, teach young girls that beauty is their most important quality. In order to prevent eating disorders and other health problems, we must change the images and role models girls are offered. So your revision is a lot more clearer than your example. So always write clearly and avoid loaded language. Wordiness. Sometimes you write way too many words. And wordiness means that you're using too many words in a sentence when you can shorten what you're writing and be more concise. And when you're more concise, then your writing is more efficient. So take a look at these examples of wordiness. I came to the realization that can be shortened to, I realized that. She is of the opinion that can be shortened to, she thinks that. Concerning the matter of could be shortened to about. During the course of this uh, winter, you could just be shortened to during. And so here are more examples of how you can shorten your uh, the way you speak. Keep an eye out for wordy constructions in your writing and see if you can replace them with more concise words or phrases. And if you want more, even more tips on how to be concise, you should buy Will Strunk's book on writing style. And I will place this um, in your classroom so that you know what I'm talking about. Will Strunk. S-T-R-U-N-K. Back in the 30s, he wrote a book about how you can write concisely. In other words, how you can write in very, very short, not very short sentences, but how to keep what you're writing in a concise manner and not be wordy. Also in academic writing, you need to avoid cliches. So it's a good idea to limit your cliches in academic writing. But what is a cliche? Clichés are catchy little phrases so frequently used that they have become trite, corny, or annoying. They are problematic because their overuse has diminished their impact and because they require several words where just one could do. The main way to avoid clichés is first to recognize them. 
and then to create shorter, fresher equivalents. Ask yourself, if there's one word that means the same thing as the cliché, then find another way to use, to, to, to avoid using that cliché and write a better way in, in regular English so that you sound more professional. If there isn't, can, if there isn't another way to use that, you know, to replace that cliché, then think to yourself, can you use two or three words to state the idea in, in another way, in your own way? So here in this example, you'll find examples of five common cliches with some alternatives to their, to the, on the right. As a challenge, how many alternatives can you create for the final two examples? So here, um, agree to disagree. So let's agree to dis agree to disagree means if someone in your, in, in your class posts something that's contradictory to what you believe, then you agree not to become angry at that person for disagreeing with you. And you agree to disagree means that netiquette, you act courteously even if somebody disagrees with you. So that's what the, that's what the uh, cliche, agree to disagree, means. It means to behave yourself. And so here you can shorten agree to disagree to disagree. Dead as a doornail. So dead as a doornail simply means someone is so tired, so, so exhausted. So another way of saying dead as a doornail would just simply mean exhausted. Last but not least, you could say, well, the last item for today's list is. So always find another way to, oh, to say the same meaning as the cliché, to express the same meaning as the cliché, but in a shorter way and in mainstream English. Pushing the envelope is when someone is approaching the limit of their exhaustedness or uh, pr approaching the limit, uh, the border of something. Up in the air means they don't know what's going on. What's going on? So if you were to say that the project, the future of the project is up in the air, so instead of saying up in the air, you would say the future of this project is undecided. Nobody knows what's going to happen next. So try these for yourself. Uh, play it by ear. So if you're a native speaker of English, I can easily come up with another way of saying play it by ear. So if I were to say something like fly by the seat of my pants, which actually means the same thing as play it by ear. So do not replace a cliche with another cliche. Okay, Fly by the seat of my pants is also a cliche. It means that you improvise, that you're, be you're being creative. Uh, that's what play it by ear means. Let the cat out of the bag means that you uh, let out a secret. In other words, you told a secret you didn't mean to tell. So you accidentally told someone something that you weren't supposed to. So that's let the cat out of the bag or let the genie out of the bottle, that sort of thing. So you don't want to use a cliche with another cliche. So you would say, I accidentally told my friend a secret. Okay, so that would be uh, wh how you would avoid cliches. So we want to avoid cliches, we want to avoid slang uh, in our academic writing because it sounds too conversational and it's, and when we write a, an essay or we write our academic papers, we want to maintain a professional tone, which is why I tell students to write in third person case. Because when we write, we are write, when we write an academic research paper, we are writing for an academic audience. And so when you choose words to express your ideas, you have to think not only about what makes sense and sounds best to you, but what makes sense and sounds best to your readers. Thinking about your audience and their expectations will help you make decisions about word choice. Some writers think academic audience says expect them to sound smart by using big or technical words. But the most important part of academic writing is not to sound smart. It is to communicate an argument or information clearly and convincingly. It is true that academic writing has a certain style of its own and that you as a student are just beginning to learn and write in that style. You may find yourself using words and grammatical constructions that you didn't use in your high school writing. The danger is that if you consciously set out to sound smart, 
and use words or structures that are very unfamiliar to you, you may produce sentences that your readers can't understand. When writing for your professors, think simplicity. Using simple words does not indicate simple thoughts. In an academic argument paper, what makes the thesis and argument sophisticated are the connections presented in simple, clear language. Keep in mind, though that simple and clear doesn't necessarily mean casual, most instructors will not be pleased if your paper looks like an instant message or an email to a friend. It's usually best to avoid slang and colloquialisms. Take a look at the example and ask yourself how a professor would probably respond to it if it were the thesis statement of a paper. Moulin Rouge really bit because the singing sucked and the costume colors were nasty. Kavim. So here is an example of speech that's too colloquial, too conversational. And so when we write an academic paper, we want to keep a professional tone. Because remember that we have to be always aware of our audience. And when we write an academic research paper, our audience is our teacher. So we want to keep our English formal. When we write to our friends and family, that's when we can use slang. Uh, that's when we can use cliches. That's when we can use contractions. And that's when we can use first and second person case. But when we are writing to our teacher, we always have to maintain formal English, such as third person case, such as no, no uh, cliches, no slang, and you write out your contractions in order to sound, and we don't use too many technical terms that go over the reader's head. So when we, whatever we write, we always have to be aware of our audience. Another thing about uh, word choice, selecting and using key terms. When writing academic papers, it is often helpful to find key terms and use them within your paper as well as in your thesis. This section comments on the crucial difference between repetition and redundancy of terms and works through an example of using key terms in a thesis statement. So repetition versus redundancy. These two phenomena are not necessarily the same. Repetition can be a good thing. Sometimes we have to use our key terms several times within a paper, especially in topic sentences. Sometimes there's simply no substitute for the key terms and selecting a weaker term as a synonym can do more harm than good. Repeating key term emphasizes important points and signals to the reader that the argument is still being supported. This kind of repetition can give your paper cohesion and is done by conscious choice. In contrast, if you find yourself frustrated, always repeating the same nouns or verbs or adjectives and making the same points over and over again, you are probably being redundant. In this case, you are swimming aimlessly around the same points because you have not decided what your argument is because you are truly fatigued and clarity escapes you. So when we write a thesis statement, we don't want to repeat the same reasons over and over again. We want to make sure that the three reasons in our thesis statement are clearly different from each other so that you don't end up repeating the same ideas over and over again. Also, if you find yourself repeating the same nouns, verbs, or adjectives, you can always go and get a Roger's thesaurus. A Roger's thesaurus is a dictionary with synonyms in it. Even though here it says, as a synonym can do more harm than good, that depends on how you use the synonym. And it also depends on how you structure that synonym in that sentence. Building clear uh, thesis statement. So we've already gone over in our class how we can build clear thesis statements. Remember that when we write a thesis statement, thesis statement is the main idea of your essay. Your thesis statement is placed as the last sentence of your first paragraph and the first sentence of your last paragraph. And your thesis statement is the main idea of your essay and summarizes the, your body, the content of your body paragraphs. So writing clear thesis statements 
is important throughout your writing. So a common problem with writing good thesis statements is finding the words that best capture both the important elements and the significance of the essay's argument. It's not always easy to condense several paragraphs or several pages into one sentence. So taking the time to find the right words is very important in a thesis statement. So here you have three examples of version one. So whenever you write a thesis statement, it's always a work in progress. And it's always OK to tweak your thesis statement many times as you write a paper. So version one, there are many important river and shore scenes in Huckleberry Finn. So this is a very vague and broad thesis statement. Version two, the contrasting river and shore scenes in Huckleberry Finn suggest a return to nature. That's better, but still too broad, too thin. What do you mean by contrasting river? And what do you mean by shore scenes? And in what way do these river and shore scenes suggest a return to nature? The answer to that research question then becomes the, uh, your final draft of your thesis statement. So here, the third draft is the best because it gives um, a clear picture to the reader of what you mean by river and shore scenes and a return to nature. So version three, through its contrasting river and shore scenes, Twain's Huckleberry Finn suggests that to find the true expression of American democratic ideals, one must leave civilized society and go back to nature. So this is a lot clearer than simply version one. There are many important river and shore scenes in Huckleberry Finn. So you can see the difference between how vague and broad the thesis statement is in version one versus the very much better version three, which is much more, um, much more clear. So let's consider word, uh, or I just went over all of this, okay. So version three is much more sophisticated because it has a return to nature and American democratic ideals. So whenever you write a thesis statement, always make sure that you have a topic, opinion, reasons, tour. That way you have an effective thesis statement. Strategies for successful word choice. Be careful when using words you are unfamiliar with. Look at how they are used in context and check their, de their dictionary definitions. Be careful when using the thesaurus. Each word listed as a synonym for the word you're looking up may have its own connotations or shades of meaning. Use a dictionary to be sure the synonym you are considering really fits what you are trying to say. Don't try to impress your reader or sound unduly authoritative. For example, which sentence is clearer to you, A or B? Under the present conditions of our society, marriage practices generally demonstrate a high degree of homogeneity. So here you have an example of too many technical words. So you want to make your, your uh, sentence simpler. So in American society, people tend to marry others who are like themselves. Okay, so this is much easier to understand. Before you revise for accurate or strong adjectives, make sure you are first using accurate and strong nouns and verbs. For example, if you are revising the sentence, this is a good book that tells about the Revolutionary War. Think about book and tells. Is that strong enough? Instead, a stronger sentence might read, this novel describes the experiences of a soldier during the Revolutionary War. So instead of using the word book, you could use the word novel. And instead of using the word tells, you could use the word describes the experiences of. So here, in this case, uh, describes the experiences of tells us more about how the book communicates information. Try the slash, op slash option technique, which is like brainstorming. When you get stuck, write out two or more choices for a questionable word or a confusing sentence. Pick the word that best indicates your meaning. Well, that's kind of like the way I write my thesis statement. 
I always write several different versions of my thesis statement until I am satisfied with what I want to write. So that is very much like pre-writing. So I do that all the time in the beginning of my um, whatever I'm going to write. Look for repetition. Make sure you don't repeat the same thing over and over again. Write your thesis in five different ways. And yes, I've done that. I've written my thesis five different ways until I found the one I, I write. Read your paper out loud and at a slow pace. So when you read your paper out loud, that way you can hear for yourself if your paper sounds right. If you need a comma, let's say whenever we use a comma, many times it's because it represents a pause in our reading. And so um, whenever we pause, that's where usually a comma goes. So that's one of the advantages of reading your paper out loud so you can uh, get all of these punctuation correct punctuation mistakes, you can correct word choice mistakes, you can hear if you say n, 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 but, 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 too many times. And if you're having too many but, 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 n, 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 think about using transition words. Transition words of addition, furthermore, moreover, uh, can be used instead of saying n, 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 and transition words of opposition, such as however, and on the other hand, can be used instead of saying but, 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 but. So when you read your paper out loud, you hear that you've written too many sentences with but, 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 but. Also, when you're reading the paper out loud, make sure you don't have too many simple sentences in a row. John is rich. John eats at a restaurant. John is bored. John, 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 John. You have a, here you have a series of simple sentences with the same subject. Think about combining those sentences like John who is rich is bored while at a restaurant. Here you have more sentence variety and you would not hear that if you didn't read your paper out loud. So that way you can have more sentence variety. And instead of reading the paper itself, Put it down and just talk through your argument as concisely as you can. In other words, pretend that you're talking to a friend on a telephone. If you get stuck on thinking to, you, to yourself, how am I going to express this argument convincingly? Then pretend that you're talking to a friend on the telephone and you're trying to convince that friend, this is a great movie for us to go see. And that's how you would write down, it's a form of brainstorming. And then you would write down on your paper, how you would convince your friend to see that movie. And then you, after that, revise to make sure you get rid of all your first and second person case. That's how you would, don't just, you could talk through your argument as concisely as you can. So if your listener quickly understands and comprehends, you can also read your paper to somebody and ask that person, do you understand what this paper is about? So this is like peer review in which you, so in, um, Certain schools, some schools have you go over to tutor.com, you know, other schools have brain fuse, and uh, other schools have smart thinking. So you can go to your, your local tutoring center to have someone look over your paper. And so have someone not familiar with the paper read over your paper. And of course, if you go to UNC, you could go to their writing center and they can uh, also help you out. But it, uh, LAPU has also a writing center and so does Fortress College. So go to your college, college writing center to help you uh, find somebody who can look over your paper to make sure that you've got correct uh, word choice, you don't have vague and awkward sentences and the like. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me anytime.